From Chicago, Illinois, the Voice of Prophecy presents live The Midnight Cry with Kenneth Cox, an adventure in understanding where we are in the light of Bible prophecy.
This morning's message is one that a lot of people have questions about. But the main thing is where we stand, on whose side we are. That's what counts more than anything else. And Steve Darmney is going to sing a beautiful song that you'll enjoy very much this morning. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. Gracious Father, this morning as we look at this very important subject, one sometimes that people struggle with, we ask that you will give us your spirit. May it enlighten our minds. May our ears be open. May our hearts be receptive. That as we read your word and study together, that we may see and understand and by faith follow those things that your Spirit has guided us into. For this we pray in your name. Amen. All you have to do is say the word, the mark of the beast, 
And it immediately brings up questions to people's minds. They want to know, well, what is the mark of the beast? What's involved? Where does it take place? Uh, people want to know where this is happening, what is taking place in their lives. These are questions that many people today are looking for, wanting to know what it means. And so this morning, we're going to go immediately to the Scripture we're going to see what the Word of God has to say about the mark of the beast. So let's take a look, see what it says here in Revelation 13, verse 6. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So it making it very clear that uh, only those people that have the mark of the beast will be able to buy or to sell. And the scripture says that there those that receive the mark of the beast will receive the wrath of God. Those that don't receive the mark of the beast will receive the wrath of men what it says. So you and I have today simply decide on whose side we're going to stand. Here is wisdom. God's telling you, here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So when you take a look at the scripture, the Bible tells you clearly that when we come to the coming of Jesus Christ, right down at the end, there will only be two classes of people. That's all. There won't be three classes. There will only be two classes. It will be those that receive the mark of the beast and those that don't. That's it. There's not going to be a middle ground. It will just be those that receive the mark of the beast and those that do not. It says this about the people that receive the mark of the beast. Revelation 14, 9, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image has received his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the what? The wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So it makes it very clear that there's going to be a group that will receive the mark of the beast. These people will receive the wrath of God. What about those that don't take the mark of the beast? Well, the Bible describes them also here in Revelation 15 and verse 2, and it says this about them. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, those who have victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. So these people that do not receive the mark of the beast, that got victory over the beast and over his image and over its mark, these are the ones that stand on the sea of glass. So this morning, it becomes very important that you know clearly who's the beast, you understand what his mark is, you understand what his number is. That becomes very, very crucial in your understanding of God's Word and following what it has to say. Now, we have spent several nights on the different beasts in Revelation and in Daniel. Uh, this morning, there is no way that I can drop back and cover all the ground that we have covered, folks. I am going to recap, in case you were not here, and try to bring you up as quickly as I possibly can, but we've got to move on in to what the mark is. So we're going to take a look at this beast in Revelation 13. We're going to see what the Scripture has to say about this beast, and we're going to very quickly identify him. I've already done that on previous nights, but we're going to recap it just for your benefit this morning. So let's see what Revelation 13 has to say about this beast. I stood on the sand of the sea, saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, 
His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And as you remember, this beast is made up of those four beasts in Daniel 7. We talked about those already. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded. His deadly wound was healed. All the world marveled, followed the beast. So it's telling us clearly signs to look for concerning this beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. They worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Then the text we read just a while ago in the 18th verse of this 13th chapter, and it says, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now that's what the Scripture says about this beast. You remember when we looked at it, I pointed out seven points which identify that beast. There's no question about it. Those seven points are these. One, it says that the dragon would give him his power, his seat, and his authority. That's one point. We looked at that on a previous night. Two, it says he would speak blasphemies. Three, he would be a persecuting power. Okay? Four, that it would rule for 42 months. These are all the points the Scripture has listed about this particular beast. Five, would receive a deadly wound. Six, the deadly wound would be healed. Seven, have the number 666. Now, folks... I invite you, if you can take those seven points and make those seven points apply to any other power on the face of the earth, I would love to hear what you have to say. I really would. I have found only one power, only one, on the earth that all seven points will apply to. And again, if you can go to the library, research it all you want to, if you can find some other power that you can put all those seven points to, please talk to me. I'd love to hear what you have to say. But I've never been able to find it fits but one power. Now, I'm going to quickly review those seven points with you. It says that the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. That dragon referred to there, folks, is pagan Rome. Scripture's perfectly clear on that. That is pagan Rome. So it says that pagan Rome would give to this beast its power, its seat, and its authority. And history tells us this is what happened. To the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. That what took place, pagan Rome gave to papal Rome its power, its seat, and its authority. History bears that out very, very clearly. Secondly, it says, and he was given authority to continue 42 months. Papal Rome came into existence in the year 538 A.D. That's when it came into existence. It says that it would last for 42 months. And you remember, we found here in Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34, God said, I have laid on you a day for a year. I have given you a day for a year. So if I've got 42 months, that if I multiply that times 30, because there are 30 days in a biblical month, that gives me 1,260. If I add 1,260 to 538, it takes me to 1798, at which time, the scripture says that the papal power would come to an end. Revelation 13, verse 7, and it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. It says that it would be a persecuting power. History bears this out very clearly. It says in the book, The Death Penalty for Heresy, morally they believe themselves to be saving thousands of souls 
by the burning of a single heretic. Politically, they believed, if possible, by sufficiently persistent and ruthless persecution to extinguish heresy altogether. And all you have to do is go down to the library, folks, pick up such books as Fox Book of Martyrs, uh, Short, Short Stories of the Reformation, History of the Reformation by D. Aubigny, uh, History of Europe by Qualbin, Here I Stand by Bainton, and there is all kinds of evidence that tells you what happened during that period of time. So it fulfills what the Scripture says. Revelation 13, 5, And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. I told you that in the Bible, blasphemy is considered when a person takes upon himself the prerogatives of God. In other words, when a person says they are God, that's blasphemy. Or when they say they have the power to forgive sins, the Bible classifies that as blasphemy. I read you this statement before. It comes from the great ecclesiastical letter of Pope Leo XIII, and he said, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. So when it says he would speak great words and blasphemy against the Most High, he has done just that. Revelation 13, 3. And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded. Now remember it says this power is the papal power. It says it would receive a mortal wound. And you remember I told you that as we come to the end of that 1260 years and we arrive at 1798, there is in Europe a lot of changes taking place. Napoleon has come to power. Napoleon wants to rule Europe, but he knows he cannot do that unless he breaks the back of the papal power. So history tells us this is what happened. 538 is when she came into power, as I told you before. 1260 years takes you to 1798. And it says here in 1798, in fact, on February the 15th, 1798, he, Berthier, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. So exactly as the scripture had foretold, when that 1260 years came to an end, there it was, and that came to an end. The papal power came to an end in 1798, as the scripture had said. But the scripture doesn't stop there, folks. It just doesn't stop there. It goes on and says, Revelation 13, 3, and his deadly wound was healed. It says not only would he receive a deadly wound, but his deadly wound was healed. All the world marveled, followed the beast. Well, that began in history what was called the Roman question, went on for a hundred years. But it was finally 1929. Mussolini settled it by signing the Lateran Pact with the papal power. This is what history tells us. San Francisco Chronicle, February the 11th, 1929. The Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy in affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing the wound, came to an end. The Roman question, exactly as it said, extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. So just as the scripture had foretold, it took place. It says that all the world would marvel and follow the beast. Let me read you one statement from the Toronto Star, March 9, 1992. Article written by Mihail Gorbachev. Okay, this is what he had to say. Now it can be said that everything which took place in Eastern Europe in recent years would have been impossible without the Pope's effort and the enormous role, including the political role, which he played in the world arena. Pope John Paul II will play an enormous political role now that profound changes have occurred in European history, and all the world wandered and followed the beast. Exactly what you see happening today is taking place. Here is wisdom, okay? God says, you really want to understand this? 
Here is wisdom. Let he, him who has understanding, calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a, come on, be clear. It's the number of a man. His number is 666. Listen one more. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So the scripture tells us it's the number of a man. It's the number of his name. Now, as we have studied all these beasts, we have found that there are certain things that are symbolic. We found that the beasts are symbolic, right? You don't have any beasts running around with seven heads, folks. Okay, that's symbolic, all right? The image is symbolic. The name is symbolic, the number is symbolic, the seal is symbolic, the mark is symbolic. You must understand that is all in symbolic language. So when we look at the number 666, it has to be symbolic. But the scripture has told us clearly that it's the number of a man, it's the number of his name. Okay, what is his official name? Well, on the crown. Triple mitre. It has the official name, and his official name is Vicarious Philae Dei. Now that is Roman, okay? Latin. When you went to school, you were taught Roman numerals, weren't you? Huh? Have you ever asked yourself why? Do you use them? No, you don't use them. But everybody's been taught them. Why? As far as I'm concerned, they're being taught that so they can answer this. You see, Roman letters are just have been given numerical value. When you were in school, V was worth how much? Five. C was worth how much? Hundred. Okay, so you know your Roman numerals. All right, let's take his name, Vicarious Philae Dei, and let's apply Roman numerals to it, see what happens here, Okay. Vicarious, V is worth five, I is worth one, C is worth a hundred, A, no numerical value, R has none, I, one. There is no U, folks. Actually, it's a V, okay? U is a modern letter. If you are having a little trouble believing me on this, then let me give you a little exercise to do. Uh, when you got a little time, just get in your car and drive down here to some of these counties and go to one of the county courthouses that's been there for a long, long time and see how they spelled court. It won't be spelled with U, okay? V is a modern term, okay? So it has the same value as V5. S has no numerical value. Phil A? F has no numerical value, I, 1, L is worth how much? 50, I, the two I's, each one, D, E, D is worth 500, E, 1, that's I worth 1, you add those together and this is what you get. See, it's the number of his name, it's the number of a man, okay? But remember, it's just symbolic, but God is saying this, is to help you and I. This is not the mark of the beast. Don't misunderstand me. This is not the mark of the beast. This is given to help you and I identify who the beast is. That's what it's given for, to help us identify who the beast is. All right, with that, let's find out what the mark of the beast is. Okay, I've taken you through enough that I hope you're a little bit on solid ground as to who the beast is. What is the mark of the beast? Revelation 13, 16 says... And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Okay? So it says that they're going to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. Now, folks, I'm going to read verses 9, 10, and 11 to you. When I'm through reading those to you, I'm going to ask you a question. If you answer me right, and I'm not going to ask you a trick question, 
A very simple one, but if you answer me right, we'll go on. If you don't answer right, we'll back it up and read them until you do answer it right. Okay? All right, so that's what we're going to do. All right, here it goes. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in this image, receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, which is poured out full strength into, his, into the cup of his indignation, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Okay? And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, folks, the simple question I want to ask you today is this. Those three verses, were they talking about people that receive the mark of the beast? Boy, you are quiet, aren't you? Uh, Chuck, if you'll just press the back key there, that would be D, and back that up for me. There you go. All right, let's read. Let's read it again. If anyone works with the beast in his image, receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, which is poured, the same shall drink the wine, which is poured out with full strength in the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. Is this talking about people who receive the mark of the beast? Huh? Are you clear on that? Yeah, that's who it's talking about. It's talking about people that receive the mark of the beast. That's what it's talking about. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Is this talking about people that receive the mark of the beast? Are you clear? All right, that's talking about people that receive the mark of the beast. Now, follow me very, very careful because I'm going to verse 12, okay? I've read 9, 10, 11. I'm going to verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Do these people receive the mark of the beast? Okay, so verses 9 through 11 is talking about those that receive the mark of the beast. Verse 12 is talking about those that don't receive the mark of the beast. Why don't they receive the mark of the beast? Ah, they don't receive the mark of the beast because they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, right? Therefore, you understand therefore? Therefore, the mark of the beast has to affect the commandments of God and faith in Jesus. Are you with me? Because if you've got faith in God and you keep God's commandments, you're not going to receive the mark of the beast. Therefore, the mark of the beast has to affect the commandments of God and faith in Jesus Christ. The mark of the beast affects two things, the commandments of God. Secondly, faith in Jesus Christ. So what we have to ask ourselves this morning, has the beast power done anything that affects faith and affects the commandments of God? See, that's what we have to ask ourselves because that's what's involved in the mark of the beast. Faith, this is what the Scripture says about faith. Romans 1, 17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith that is written, the just shall live by what? By faith. The just shall live by faith. Okay. What does? And being found in him not having our own righteousness, which is from the law, by that which is through what? Faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. So the righteous live by faith and their righteousness is given to them by faith in Jesus Christ. Comes no other way. Are you with me? Amen. Now, then what we have to ask is, has the beast power said anything about faith? Well, let's see how they say that you're saved. There is only one holy and Catholic and apostolic church outside of which there is no salvation. And just three weeks ago, there was a statement made in this that upset the whole Christian community 
around the world because they were reinstating this. Outside of which there is no salvation for every creature to be subject to the Roman potter. It says salvation comes only that way. Let me read you one about faith. Council of Trent. If anyone shall say that by faith alone the sinner is justified, how are you justified? By faith alone. Okay. If anyone shall say that by faith alone the sinner is justified so as to understand that nothing else is required to cooperate in the attainment of the grace of justification and that it is in no way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the actions of his own will, let him be anathema. So it makes it very clear they do not accept righteousness by faith. Okay, what about? What about keeping God's commandments? Does the Lord have anything to say to you and me in regard to keeping his commandments? John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Dear friend, let me tell you something. Marvelous thing about this book is every time you open it, it says the same thing. And I run on people that want to say, oh, you don't have to keep the commandments of God. I'm sorry, every time I read that, it tells me the same thing. If you love me, keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. So God makes it clear, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So God makes it very clear that he wants you and I to keep his commandments. Okay, what does the papal power say about it? Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 4, page 153, The Church after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath to the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as a day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. Not only did they change the fourth commandment, but they did away with the second one. And it's not there in the catechism at all. They took the tenth one and divided it. Uh, when I read the next statement that I'm going to read to you, I, I really had a hard time thinking that maybe that had been written by a priest. So I called him up, and I talked to him personally. And he told me, no question, I wrote it, it's what I believe, what I believe is true. This is what he says, listen, folks. This came from St. Catherine's Catholic Church. That was written May 21, 1995. This is what he said. Perhaps the boldest thing that most revolutionary change the church has ever did happened in the first century. Now listen. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any direction noted in Scripture, okay, but from the church's sense of its own power. said... Nothing in here, nothing in here that gives that right. It's just the church's sense of its own power. Now listen. People who think that the scripture should be the sole authority. I'm going to ask you, do you think the word of God should be your sole authority? Is, is that what you think? Okay, listen. Should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. What he's, that's what a priest is saying. He said, if you're going to build your faith on the word of God and you're going to say, this is where I stand, then, dear friend, let me tell you something. You have only one thing you can do, and that's keep the Sabbath. Because there is no scriptural authority for the changing of the Sabbath. It's not there. Let me read you another one. This comes from the Catholic record. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transfer of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. They said it's above it. Okay. Revelation 13, 15. And he was granted power, okay, to give breath to the image of the beast. Now, I told you when it talks about giving breath to an image... Okay, and I told you that if you're going to make an image, 
If you're going to make an image of a dog, you make it look like a cat. Huh? No, if you're going to make an image of a dog, you make it look like a dog. Well, if this beast is going to make an image of the papal power, then it's got to be like the papal power, and the papal power stands for unification of church and state. Okay, so when it speaks of this power here giving life or breath to the image of the beast, that means it makes it come to life. Are you with me? All right. So what happens here? And the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Anytime you have a beast and it says it speaks and it causes, speak means legislation. Cause means enforcement. So that's literally what it means. So it says that there will be government power. He what? Cause. That means enforcement. Caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. The mark of the beast must be enforced by government. Therefore, today, at this time, people do not have the mark of the beast because it has not been enforced by government. Okay? Is there tendencies that way? Is there anything happening? Well, let me read you some statements that was made lately. This comes from a Roman catechism. 1985, the civil authority should be urged to cooperate with the church in maintaining and strengthening this public worship of God and to support with their own authority the regulations set down by the... And I'm saying civil authority should cooperate with the pastor and do this. For it, is the, for it is only in this way that the faithful will understand why it is Sunday and not the Sabbath day that we keep holy. said, enforce it. One more. This comes from another edition, 1994. In respecting religious liberty and the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sunday and the church's holy days as legal holidays. It is time that we demonstrate our Catholic vitality and engage in public policy debate. We have the power and the people to embark on this movement a movement that will benefit all Americans. So what I'm telling you today, it's taking place. It's developing quickly. How will this happen? How will the mark of the beast go into effect? Uh, folks, if you say you can't buy or sell, that's called what? Boycott. But you can't boycott people as long as they've got money. Because if you can't buy it at the front of the store, you can buy it at the back of the store. Okay? But something is happening that's changing all that today and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. You know what's changing it? This. Internet. You see, it's possible for you to shop today anywhere in the world. You can get on the Internet. You can buy things all over the world. But these people in other worlds or other countries that uh, are selling products, they want to make sure they're being paid. So what is developing? What is developing is what is called cyber money. Cyber money makes it possible for you to buy something in Denmark and pay for it. But you've got to have a number to do that. And any time you have a number... All they've got to do is say, don't accept that number, and you've been boycotted. We are quickly moving to a cashless society, much quicker than most people have any idea of. What about the believers today? What about you and me? This is what it says. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What does it mean? Who are God's followers? Let me tell you quickly who God's followers are. They worship the Lord. They're people that follow the Lord. 
follow the Lord Jesus Christ. They're a small group. I'm sorry. Never going to be a great big group. The Bible doesn't promise that. So don't expect it to be. Thirdly, they believe in salvation by Jesus alone. No other way. Four, they keep God's commandments. Five, they have faith in Jesus. I'm talking about believers of today. Have God's seal in their forehead. These are God's people. What about they uphold God's Sabbath? These are people that follow the Lord. What about those that follow the beast? What does the Bible say about them? Well, they're going to worship the beast. That's who they give their commitment to. Secondly, they're a huge group, vast majority. If you think you're going to follow the majority and get to heaven, you missed it. Sorry. Third, they believe in salvation by works. Four, they keep men's commandments. Five, presumption is the place of faith. Have the beast mark in their forehead, and they uphold the Sunday counterfeit. That's what the scripture says. Two different groups. There's not, there's not three groups, folks. There's only going to be two. That's it. Peter, the other apostles, they said this. When they asked him, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. You see, you and I must place ourselves completely upon God's side, follow him. You see, God today, we're down at the end, folks. God today is asking you to decide you know, who are you going to worship? Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. And take that white card that you received when you came in. Three questions I'd like for you to look at with me. First question says, I'm willing to follow the Lord by faith. That's a very, very heavy question. That means I'm going to walk and follow the Lord in what he says by faith. If you're willing to follow him by faith, put a check by number one. Second question, I'd like to keep his commandments. If you'd like to keep God's commandments, put a check by number two. Third question, I'd like to keep the Sabbath. You see, what's involved here is the commandments of God and faith in Christ. And if you'd like to keep God's commandments, keep his Sabbath, then put a check by number three. Fourth question, I'd like to accept Christ, be baptized. This morning, you'd like to accept Christ as your Savior, be baptized, then put a check by number four. Put your name and address on it and fill it out as Maddie sings. So choose ye this day. 